Bert Watt actually said when the lid blew off his kettle isn't recorded, but he got the rest of the world steamed up and going places in quite a short time. What makes the wheels go round? Mr. Maskelin, own brother to a magician, says a word over a 60-year-old model engine and it practically gets up and speaks for itself. First you need the boiler, usually copper for model engines. Naturally a drop of water, ready to be pumped in from the tank in the tender, comes in useful. Oil fuel is burned in this model. Enough fuel is stored in the tender for an afternoon's run. The flames pass along the tubes and the water round them boils. If the fire's all round and the water goes through the tubes instead, the result's just as good, plenty of steam either way. Then there's the regulator, the thing the driver keeps his hand on when he leans out waiting for the guard's flag. He gives it the old one-two and bang goes the steam into the valves and cylinders and the piston rods get busy on the wheels. The valve sends steam first to one wheel, then the other. A puff here, a puff there. According to the type of engine, it sounds like puff or puff. The only thing remaining is the eccentric, the Adam's apple thing on the wheel, that lets steam into the valves a swallow at a time. If we push the lever forward, the train goes right ahead. Push it back, and we back straight into the up express. Let's call the incident closed and get back to once upon a line. Model locomotives take us back 120 years to the rocket. First the model rocket, then the real thing. They had railway police in those days too. He's flagging us into the good old days before signals were thought of. These are the trains Grandad rode in, when any speed over 10 miles an hour meant righteous letters to the morning mail signed, Mother of Seven Poor Babes. Pretty drafty conveyances they were too, none of that newfangled nonsense about windows. At a three-line crossover, unique in the world, by the way, we catch a train back to modernity, comfort and flu. Though I must say Mr. Fox, astride his silver cup model of 1945, seems to take the compliments of the season without turning a hair. They believe in life in the open at the Ilford and West Essex Club. The Lord Nelson will go five miles without a drink. Mr. Riddle visits Mr. Franks at Ilford. Round London alone there are 15 district clubs whose members are devoted railway engineers at weekends only. These are the men who swore they'd be engine drivers when they grew up. Mr. Frank's Green Arrow pulls 14 times her own weight. She weighs 40 pounds. That's what they force a third of a horse to do for a living. Ride something your own size, can't you? A seven and a half inch gauge model. Its valves have the collie wobbles just now and the owner's really worried. In another room, a cheerful group forgets this season's worries and plans another mile or two of track. Still more planning went to get the giant Vulcan shipped to India. Its gauge won't fit British lines, so somebody took the loco for a ride. Seems loco to me. And the boys of Dulwich College have gone loco too on an engine named Dulwich. They don't find it dull, though.
Every generation of schoolboys collects train numbers. Spitfires have made no difference. It's still a day well spent watching the wheels go round. A day in the sheds, and then a weekend fete with the engines of the Sutton Club in full cry at sixpence a time. Sixpence a time is about the cost of stoking Mr. Jeffrey's model. The fire box takes paraffin-soaked charcoal. Then the forced draft nozzle puts the wind up the boiler and steams up in ten minutes or less. It takes a full-size locomotive half an hour. First stop is the water tower. Rainwater to stop fur in the old kettle, filtered to stop dirt getting into the works. He tanks up at one go for the afternoon. A full-size job fills up at one go for only 40 miles. You'd think an express would carry more, but it doesn't often. When pressure's at 100 pounds, the safety valve blows and the run starts. 20 miles an hour is top speed. At the end of the day, Mr. Jeffrey turns stoker and cleans out his own fire tubes. He has seven locomotives, all made in his own workshop. A 38-year-old, still OK under the lid. At Malden, another Saturday afternoon goes pleasantly west. At Romford, they'd like two Saturdays a week to get through club business. This was the first continuous two-and-a-half-inch gauge track laid in the country. See the tablet. They're getting steam up on the consolidated fiery fanny, using a homemade vacuum pump with gears pinched from an old clock, so it should tick over all right. Mr. Stuttle's flying Scotsman is sprung wheel by wheel, and the springs come from Mrs. Stuttle's late corsets, but that's a family secret. The afternoon ends with a bit of track pounding. Some of the models used that afternoon were LNER, General Purpose, does anything except the fastest work. Green Arrow hauls heavy passenger and fast freight. Annie Body is a little number for beginners. She took only eight months to build. That's a short time. A nice complicated model takes a year or two. Something special eats into half a lifetime. The Dyak, a prize winner. This is a famous iron horse at Charity Fates. It has earned twice its weight in silver. An express in little, the Sandringham. The table turns and it's a full-scale express showing off its modern streamlining. Our old friend Steam is the power behind the turn. Steam is piped into an engine under the runway and the driver controls the operation from the cab. Time swings on. Time continues to pass. This explains why the 810 is sometimes late. Anyway, in the long run, we swing over to a small-scale model that has a roomy acre of garden to spread itself. About one-eighth full size, this locomotive pulls 24 people at 20 miles per hour. <laughs> 